that, we'd love to welcome you to this week's Citizens Climate University, a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics relating to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and tonight's topic is going to dive in part one of two to our June 2021 monumental June Lobby Day training, and we'll focus specifically on primary and supporting asks. So Dr. Danny Richter is gonna join us tonight for a training that's gonna review the updates and context for CCL's 2021 primary and supporting asks, as well as providing guidance for lobby teams as you plan for your online meetings. And again, a reminder, we're going a whole 90 minutes tonight to answer all your questions. So I'm gonna actually introduce Danny and then pass it to him. Dr. Richter joined CCL staff way back in the Stone Ages, 2013. Can you imagine the world was actually around back then? as five years as a volunteer at that point. Danny completed his PhD and got paid to do scientific research on all seven continents. You can ask about that in Poll EV if you want. And as CCL's first staffer in Washington, DC, Danny established that office where he's been responsible for developing our overall legislative strategy, clarifying the details of the policies that we support and leading to many of the studies that we've all come to love. We are so honored for you to be here, Danny. The floor is yours and everyone, you're in for a real treat tonight. Let's jump in. Thank you, Brett. Uh, and thank you everybody for taking time from your evenings to be here and prepare yourselves for our June lobby days. The first section, I'm gonna cover the primary asks. The second uh, section, I'm gonna provide some of the context in which we're operating in. The third section, we'll get to supporting asks. And as I said, there'll be a Q&A between each of those sections. So let's get started on the first section, uh, the primary asks, and I have three goals, three learning goals for all of you tonight. I hope that after this presentation, you will be able to deliver the message that the US is only one of two developed economies that do not have a carbon price. All other developed economies have a carbon price. Second learning goal, uh, I want you to be able to practice presenting this information uh, tailored to both Democrats and Republican members of Congress. There's a different message required for Democrats than for Republicans. I want you to have that down by the end of this presentation. And three, I want you to understand the specific role of each of the submitted carbon pricing bills in our asks. Uh, there are three currently submitted bills. I expect there to be four by the time our uh, lobby week rolls around. And I do recognize that uh, some of you will be having uh, your lobbying meetings outside of our lobby week. That's okay, uh, but uh, just want to have it down. Uh, so here's the agenda for part one, primary ask. First, I'll talk about what are the facts on the ground. Second, talk about the primary asks for Democrats. Then we'll talk about the primary asks for Republicans. I'll bring it all together with a summary, and then we'll have our first Q&A discussion. So let's let's go ahead and get started. The primary asks, the United States is one of only two developed economies that don't have a carbon price. Really? Can that possibly be true? Uh, well, yes, really, that, that actually is true. Uh, and the way we arrived at this information, very complicated, very detailed. We compared one list from the UN to another list from the World Bank and two things didn't match. They're, they're, that was the United States and Australia. Is the, are, those are the only countries that have developed economies but no national carbon price. Uh, and here's, here's, here's the list, in case you don't believe me, this uh, work was put together by Sarah Wanis, one of our research coordinators. This will be available for you as a one pager. Uh, just to prove it to yourself, or if you want to present it to your member of Congress because they find it difficult to believe, we have this for you. Uh, and you'll notice that Australia, they, they have something that is similar. They're, they're calling it, uh, they call it a, a, it's actually a baseline and offset. Uh, and so that should actually be corrected before we, we get that baseline and offset. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about, about this because this is a this is a developing story. Actually, um, as of last week, the, the World Bank List actually classified the baseline and offset Australian program as a carbon price. And it was only nine hours ago that I realized that they changed that. <laughs> and so it used to be that we were able to say that the United States was the only developed economy. 
Uh, and so let's let's look a little bit closer at this Australian situation. So uh, Australian carbon prices, they, they do have a carbon price, but because it's based on offsets and because offsets are questionable in terms of how much carbon is actually being offset, I think what happened is the, U, is the World Bank decided to stop counting that as a carbon price. So nothing in Australia changed. And here, this is a, from an article uh, that uh, you can see that there is a price, a nationwide price, but because it's based on offsets, that doesn't meet the, the criteria of, of what the World Bank is saying. And so, uh, and, but these, the price is expected to trip to double by 2030 in Australia. And I also want to address some questions that you might have or your member of Congress or their staffer might have. So question number one, what, what is a developed economy? Well, uh, this is something that the UN developed. There are a lot of things that go into it. Uh, we weren't able to find any uh, clear and concise definition, but there's a, a weighted analysis of metrics, including uh, the Gini coefficients, uh, market exchange rate conversions, GDP growth, and inflation. All of that goes into that. Uh, and you might ask, well, what about, what about Reggie? What about California's cap and trade program? Those are not at the federal level. Those are state level or regional level programs. Uh, all other developed economies have a national carbon price, uh, except the World Bank doesn't count Australia's baseline and offset program as a carbon price. And then uh, you might also ask, what about Russia? Well, actually, the UN doesn't count Russia as a developed economy. Uh, we weren't able to find a clear explanation of why, but uh, it looks like uh, prominent reasons are the levels of poverty within, within Russia and the reliance of their economy on raw materials, uh, such as oil and, and natural resources. Uh, and that will come into play again later in, in the conversation. Uh, so this is the core message in all of the primary asks that I want you to deliver to Congress is that the US is one of two developed economies that does not have a price on carbon. All our peers, all our other peers have a price on carbon. So uh, let's, let's look a little bit further into this. So how do we translate this message into primary asks for Democrats? The key here is going to bring it, be to bring it back to Biden. And so we've divided uh, Democrats into three groups. We actually have three primary asks for Democrats. We've got a primary ask for Senate Democrats, a primary ask for House Democrats who are already co-sponsors of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, and a third group, House Democrats who are not yet co-sponsors. And uh, for Senate Democrats, we are gonna be asking them to co-sponsor the Durbin bill or the White House bill. And uh, just a little, a little note on the White House bill, that is not yet introduced, but we do expect it to be introduced by the week of the 14th. And I plan to talk about that more on next week's CCU. So, uh, and, and if you do, another note on this, if you do download any of the primary asks, you'll note that they have a draft watermark on them. And that's because we don't yet have the title for the White House bill. And we don't want you sending these primary asks to your members of Congress until we know what that title is. So please do not send the drafts. Uh, by next Thursday, we expect to be able to finalize that. And then we will want you to send it in advance of your meeting, whether that's the week of the 14th or past that. Again, I know that uh, scheduling is dragging. That's okay. Just please don't send them while they have that draft watermark. So again, Senate Democrats co-sponsored the Durbin bill, co-sponsored the, uh, the White House bill. For House Democrats who are not yet a co-sponsor of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, we want them to co-sponsor the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, that is HR 2307. And for House Democrats who are already a co-sponsor, we want them to speak publicly about their co-sponsorship of this bill and ways in which they can uh, speak publicly about that. Uh, we highlight uh, in related hearings, talk about their co-sponsorship on their website, talk about their co-sponsorship 
in conversations with their colleagues on the Hill, uh, with the administration, at public appearances in the districts, talk about their co-sponsorship, and perhaps in an op-ed that they author or potentially co-author, potentially with you. Those are all the ways that we highlight in the primary ask for Democrats in the House who are already a co-sponsor on the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. So those are the primary asks for Democrats. And so what, what is driving this? As I said, this all comes back to Biden for Democrats. Right now, we have um, the Biden administration. They started with four priorities uh, going into this uh, administration. Number one, COVID. Number two, the economy. Number three, racial justice. And number four, climate. I put check marks here next to COVID and the economy because of that historic $1.9 trillion package uh, that uh, was passed through reconciliation earlier this year. I know that more is being done on, on the economy uh, in particular and, and is planned, but when push comes to shove, I think that Biden will look back to that success and, and run on that success, even if he doesn't get anything else. So it is a, it is a remarkable legislative accomplishment. So I'm putting a check mark. Uh, racial justice, I think that that's permeating everything that Biden does. I think that uh, everything that uh, he and his administration do, they're asking these questions. Uh, so I don't think that will just be going through Congress, although that is a part of Biden's congressional agenda. I think it's in all of his executive orders and probably we're not gonna get a real check mark even by the end of, of his administration on that. Uh, and then climate, this is his fourth priority. Uh, and with climate is tied very closely to infrastructure. And we're in the middle of a lot of those, a lot of those discussions right now. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about Biden and climate. So he has already had a pretty flashy Earth Day summit with world leaders about climate. And what he did there is he staked his reputation for success on one of his top four priorities on international success. Uh, so Biden has said, part of my success on climate, part of how you should judge me, is having international success. And this is our point of traction. Because if all of our peers already have a price on carbon, if they have already acted on the science, remember the IPCC says that the uh, all uh, to have uh, all serious uh, climate legislation uh, has to have a carbon price. It's a necessary component of ambitious climate legislation. The IPCC has said that. And if all of our peers have done that and we haven't, how can we possibly lead? If we're not doing what is necessary, if, if we don't have Congress who is passing this and the next president can undo whatever executive orders Biden does, why should other countries trust America? We need to level up. If we want to play at this high stakes poker table, we need to pay the buy-in. And if we don't have a carbon price, we haven't paid the buy-in. So this is pretty high stakes for Democrats. Uh, and the, the fate of whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, your fate is very closely tied to the person in the presidency. So if Biden is to succeed for Democrats, I think we need to make the point that we are isolated on this issue. We're out of line with the science and we are not going to really going to be able to have international success until we level up with the rest of the developed world. So yeah, international success depends on Congress passing a carbon price. You may have seen news articles about the Biden administration searching for a way to do a border adjustment without a carbon price. I don't think that's possible. I think the Biden administration is trying to do everything they can to do that, uh, but I just, I just don't think that that's possible. Uh, other countries probably won't count regulations, subsidies, tax credits or standards for a border adjustment because they probably can't. WTO law, World Trade Organization law requires equal treatment. And if you layer on all the uncertainties of a standard and how that's applied in different regions of an economy, 
or uh, a regulation and how you monetize a regulation for different industries in different states. Uh, and you layer on top of that, calculating it and the errors that can include there with uh, currency fluctuations between different countries, it's probably going to be illegal because according to the WTO, because it treats different countries differently. We're gonna remember the, the WTO, there are two conditions. You have to have national treatments and you have to have most favored nation. Uh, most favored nation is that all countries are most favored, that you treat all countries equally. And national treatment is that you treat all countries as, as you do industries in your own nation. And so with regulation, subsidies, tax credits, uh, and standards, it's probably impossible to meet both national treatment and most favored nation because of the complexities I just outlined. So that is why the Biden administration is probably gonna be unsuccessful in trying to have a border carbon adjustment without a domestic carbon price. Uh, so this is definitely an article, uh, an argument that we should be using with progressive green groups who have moved away from a carbon price. Uh, carbon prices are still the fastest, biggest, least cost way to reduce emissions. It is enormously popular among our peer countries. And in fact, we are, we in Australia are the only countries not doing it, but Australia is farther along, much farther along than we are. Uh, regulation, subsidies, standards, and credits are unlikely to be, to get any credit at the border. Uh, and Another thing you can throw in here, particularly in Senate offices, is that a carbon price is a potential pay for. And what I mean by a pay for is that President Biden wants to do a lot of things. Uh, some of that is unfunded. This is a way of raising revenue that can pay for those other things that he, he wants to do. And really, this, this, this should be a, a pretty devastating argument. Uh, the, the international perspective for progressive green groups who have moved away away from a carbon price. Uh, because the bottom line is that if you're moving away from a carbon price, you're moving away from the science, you're moving away from the economists, you're moving away from our peer countries. And progressives in this country, generally speaking, are more likely to reference policies in other countries as something that we should try and emulate in this country. So if all of the countries that they're using for examples in other policies have already done this, they are in line with scientists and economists, that's pretty problematic for them. Uh, so that's something that we can use with, uh, with progressive organizations. And in summary, uh, the US and Australia are the last developed economies to have a carbon price. Australia is further along than we are. U.S. will not be able to drive international ambition until we are at least as serious as the rest of our peers. And because of a lack of a clear, clear price and the probability of unequal treatment of, to other countries, a carbon price is the only climate policy that can be border adjusted legally under the WTO. And again, I just want to emphasize, this is, this is a really, really powerful argument right now for Democrats, whose state is tied to Biden's success, who has tied his, he's told us that we should, we should measure his success as a president based on how successful he is on climate in the international sphere. And this should be really effective with, I know a lot of you have struggled with progressive green groups who have moved away from a carbon price, pointing out where we sit in the international stage with our peer countries provides a new context and we can just we can just hammer this argument because we are a holdout on this policy type uh, we are as the United States we are not aligned with scientists we are not aligned with economists we are not aligned with our peer countries that's that's very problematic so that's that's the position on the democratic side uh, but for Republicans, the, you, you need, you can have the, uh, oh, summary, we are isolated, we're isolated because we're not doing the most basic thing that our peers are doing. Scientists and economists agree this is the least cost way to reduce the largest amount of emissions, the fastest. This is doable, this is fast, this is popular, 
And for senators in particular, this can help you solve your pay for problems. Uh, now let's consider Republicans. Because for Republicans, a different narrative is required using the same basic information, but you need to, you need to tell a different story. Uh, and here's the, the teaser. Republicans, do you want America to fund European, the European welfare state? And so let me, let me talk about that. So that was, that was just a teaser. Uh, so let's start with the, the asks. So for Senate Republicans, the ask is to read the border adjustment language in the Durbin, White House, and Coons 116th Congress, the Climate Action Rebate Act bills. So we're only referencing, uh, referencing Senate bills. And for House Republicans, it's very similar, but we're only gonna reference House bills, read the border adjustment language in the Deutsch, Fitzpatrick, and Newman slash Durbin bills. The Newman is the, the House lead on the Durbin bill. That they have, they're in both, both chambers. So that's what we're doing. What we want Republicans to do is really engage with carbon pricing and to engage with the language. And so we're asking them to really focus on the border adjustment language. This is a good access point, we think, for Republicans. Uh, and let's, let's now, let's get to the, the story because uh, they do require a different narrative. Uh, unlike Democrats, just saying that we're unlike developed countries, that's unlikely to resonate uh, with Republicans. Republicans are very comfortable in American exceptionalism. The fact that other countries are, are, are not doing this policy doesn't really bother them. They might even like it. Uh, another piece of information uh, that is needed to really hook Republican audiences is that these other countries stand to benefit from our inaction. And so let's talk about that. Uh, how, how do other countries benefit from our inaction? Uh, well, it, it gets down to the fact that the European Union, which is the largest foreign market available to American producers, uh, they're, they're considering uh, and actively moving on a carbon border adjustment mechanism. This is a key part of our messaging back in March. And so with this carbon border adjustment mechanism, they're demanding accountability in the largest foreign market available to U.S. producers for their carbon emissions. Canada, which is our largest trading partner, uh, they are interested, they're looking into a carbon border adjustment mechanism as well. Uh, they're not as far along as the Europeans, but they are still looking into this. Uh, and the EU is, is setting record high carbon prices above 50 euros uh, in the European market. And Canada has set a target of 170 Canadian dollars by 2030. That's about 130 US dollars. And from what we've studied about the WTO law, Carbon border adjustment mechanisms are legal if they, one, have an environmental purpose, two, are non-discriminatory between different countries, that's that national treatment uh, and that most favored nation principle, and three, if they can be easily assessed. It needs to be explicit. It needs to, you need to be able to have an explicit price. You can't guess like with a regulation about what the price is. You can't guess like with a standard about what the price is. It needs to be explicit. So, uh, these, these are keys, and here's the key question. Republican staffer, Republican senator, Republican member of Congress. Are you okay with money going to the Europeans and Canadians that could have stayed here? And this is true because of the way that carbon border adjustment mechanisms are likely to play out. If the European Union has a carbon border adjustment mechanism and the United States doesn't, and we send goods to Europe at the European border, they charge the carbon border adjustment mechanism and they get to use that money. But if we have a carbon price, we keep that money and then the European Union, they just declare, declare equivalence because it, it is gonna remain complicated and burdensome and expensive to calculate uh, and refund the, the, uh, the fee or the tax as it leaves the United States. And it's gonna be complicated and uh, expensive again at the European border to, to assess it again. This is why in every version of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, it has in induced the secretary, it has directed the secretary of state to pursue treaty formation, to suspend in whole or in part the border adjustment if, uh, if it, a treaty can be arranged and equivalence is arrived at. And so because it's so complicated, uh, 
if you have two countries that both have a carbon price, there's a strong pressure to just declare equivalence and to not rebate and then refund. But if we don't have a carbon price, the Europeans have to assess it. The Europeans get to keep that money. If we had one, we would have kept that money. China and Russia have figured this out. Russia, again, who has a, and this is where Russia comes in, they, they have a, uh, not a developed country, dependent on extractive industries. They have figured out that they stand to lose about $8 billion a year because of the European carbon border adjustment mechanism. And so a carbon pricing policy has been read out in the Duma, the Russian parliament. So Russia is actively considering a carbon price because they want to claim that $8 billion. China, which already has a carbon price, they are working on speeding the deployment of that carbon price to more sectors of their economy, again, because of the European carbon border adjustment mechanism. So the actions of Russia and China and the fact that in news articles, they're citing the European carbon border adjustment mechanism that helps us make the argument. This also is a really important argument for Republicans because it's been a outstanding question. We've gotten this a lot from Republican offices over the years. I don't believe that the border adjustment will enforce good behavior. Well, now we have the European Union talking about a border adjustment and it's enforcing good behavior, it hasn't even gone into effect yet. And so uh, China and Russia, those are good counterexamples to this longstanding Republican argument. You can point to that if you get this and say, look, uh, China and Russia are doing it, the EU hasn't even implemented it. Think how much stronger the compliance would be if we did this as well. Business has also figured this out, the consequences for the United States, the consequences for their business, the consequences of, again, all these other developed economies doing this. And I think that this, in large part, explains the rash of recent statements of support you've seen from businesses. This is, an, you know, to top it off, again, with the Republican office, this is not something we should be afraid of. American industry is already very efficient thanks to the innovation and competition that you, Republican legislator, and your party have been so diligent at trying to enforce in the American economy. So because of that, America is, as a whole, already two times more efficient for carbon emissions compared to the rest of the world. So why should we change course, course and shy away from competing with the world when we are already more efficient. Uh, to make the, the, um, the business case, we are updating the, uh, the business case, Carbon Pricing is a popular document. There have been a lot of uh, new, new announcements. For example, the National Ocean, Ocean Industries Administration, which includes uh, offshore oil drilling. It includes offshore wind. They've issued a statement in support of a carbon price. The International Institute of Finance has issued a statement in support of a carbon price. Maersk, the, the big shipping company, if you've ever seen, been to a port and you see those big containers, Maersk is right there. They called for $150 a ton carbon tax on shipping oil just this week. It's huge. So this rash of, of, business, uh, of, of business statements of support continuing. We're working on getting this document updated. It will be there for you to use in uh, Republican offices to underline this point. The carbon pricing is popular. Businesses are noticing the trend. They believe we can compete as Americans. We can innovate. Uh, and we want you to help us compete, uh, Republican senator, Republican congressman. So to summarize, the U.S. and Australia are the only developed countries without a carbon price. And Australia is further along than we are. The largest foreign market available to us and our largest trading partner are figuring out border adjustments. And in action, in action is tantamount to shoveling American money to Europeans and Canadians for no good reason. This isn't even something we should be afraid of because American business is already doing so great. And as a bonus, car border carbon adjustments, uh, sorry, I'm, I can't see what I wrote because somebody is in the chat, uh, do enforce good behavior uh, look at China and Russia. Uh, they are responding to the EU's action. 
So uh, we're getting close to the end of this section. Let's talk about the role of, of different bills. Uh, I've mentioned a lot of different bills, so let's talk about them. The Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, the Deutsche Bill in the House, uh, current, I checked it today, 58 co-sponsors, although I got another note. I don't know if she's reflected, but Jackie Spire has rejoined. So yay, I saw we had some Spire uh, constituents on, congratulations. Uh, but the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, uh, we use this for both House Republicans and House Democrats in the primary act. And we want this to be the vehicle for showing carbon pricing is popular uh, in Congress, especially among the party that holds the gavel in both chambers. We want as many people on this bill as possible. Uh, so this is, this is the role that this bill plays is this is the numbers game. This is where we drive uh, the popularity of this policy. It's clean, it's simple. Uh, we, we, this is still our favorite. Uh, the Fitzpatrick Market Choice Act. This is the only carbon price with a Republican on it, uh, but it is also quite clearly a tax increase. Uh, and so arguably this is the least Republican uh, or conservative of all the bills. Uh, and it probably doesn't make the bottom quintile whole. And so probably doesn't meet our second criteria, if something we would recommend support of. Uh, but it is unusually relevant given the president's interest in infrastructure, and it does have that border adjustment language that in the ask for House Republicans, we are using to focus their minds and to engage more deeply with border adjustments, how the U.S. might level up to the rest of our peers with developed economies. So that's the role of the Fitzpatrick bill. Uh, with the Durbin-Newman uh, bill, uh, this is going to be the, the bill for getting the most co-sponsorships from, from Senate Democrats. Uh, Durbin is uh, the number two Democrat in the Senate. So we want to draw this to the attention of Senate Democrats in particular for the Newman bill. We're not trying to get um, co-sponsors on that in the House. We want to drive all our co-sponsorships to the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act but we're fine with directing Republicans to consider the, the language again around the border adjustment in the House version of this bill. So that's how we're using this one. The White House bill, again, this, we don't expect this to come out until next week. We'll give you more details uh, next week, uh, but we do expect it to have big new elements that uh, should address a lot of the concerns that labor and environmental justice groups have been voicing. So if that does indeed turn out to be the case, this will be particularly good for senators uh, for whom either of these groups is important and generally getting those on the left who have moved away from a carbon price to have a second look. Uh, so that's the role of the White House bill. Uh, because this is Senate only as many senators as we can on either the Durbin bill or the White House bill, that's great. Again, showing support uh, within, within the Senate. So let's recap this. For Senate Republicans, the title is Help America Compete. And the, 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 where the rubber meets the road, read the border adjustment language in the Durbin, the White House and the Coons bills, and the Coons bill from the 116th Congress, because he hasn't introduced something into the 117th yet. Cross Republicans, very similar, read, help America compete, read the border adjustment language in the Deutsch Fitzpatrick, uh, and actually should have changed it. It, it should just be the, uh, the uh, Newman bill. Um, the Durbin is the, White, is the Senate version, the White House won't be in the House, so apologies. It's clear in the primary ask. Uh, let's move on to the Democrats. For Senate Democrats, co-sponsor the Durbin bill or co-sponsor the White House bill. Uh, on the House side, for non-co-sponsors, support the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, and by support, we mean co-sponsor. And for current co-sponsors on the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, speak publicly about your support for for this bill. So those are the primary asks. And uh, now, so let's move on to the big picture. Uh, so three learning goals from here. Uh, number one, uh, I want you to be able to describe our ideal outcome. I wanna be clear on what, what we're shooting for. And this, this gets to some of the, que the question that I did not answer uh, earlier, because I wanna to get to it now. I want you at the end of this section to understand how reality constrains that idea ideal and what that means for our advocacy, again, relates to some of the questions you were asking. And I would like you to be able to articulate clearly the bubbling support for carbon pricing. I already mentioned some of this, but I wanna bring in some new storylines uh, and some new resources for you. So for this part, first of all, I wanna talk about getting from here to there, to where we wanna be. Uh, we'll dive in on how carbon pricing is popular 
We're going to talk a bit about building tangible support, what that means. I'll summarize and we'll have our second Q&A. So getting from here to there, uh, this is where, where do we want to be? So this is our best case scenario. This is what we want. This is our ideal. We want to pass a standalone carbon fee and dividend bill with bipartisan support through regular order. This would require 60 votes to overcome the filibuster. I don't think that this is impossible, but I do think it's low probability. Nonetheless, we maintain hope for this outcome. This is what we're asking for. This is the context that I want you to be talking about with your members of Congress. But uh, we have to be constrained by reality. So this is our best case. This is what we want. This is, this is the reality we'd like to manufacture around ourselves. Uh, but what is, uh, what is the reality? Climate policy is likely to happen this year. Uh, now, it could happen through regular order, which again requires 60 votes to pass the filibuster, but only 51 to pass, or it could be through budget reconciliation. Uh, and this is, uh, budget reconciliation is the process by which you only need 50 votes, uh, but it's inelegant. It's, as the name suggests, a process, legislative process, parliamentary process to reconcile the budget. Big things can be done through reconciliation, but they're, they're clunky. They're, for example, there has to be some effect on the budget. So uh, right now, for those who are pushing for a clean electricity standard, uh, just a standard is not gonna have any effect on the budget. And so they're, they're contorting the policy, uh, doing tie-in pretzels to come up with some sort of budget effect, some sort of price. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's just more complicated that way. Uh, and what, we're likely to get, I think that where we're likely to get is a situation where we are picking and choosing from, from other bills, from other standalone bills. I do think that in this scenario with Biden's priority of passing something on climate this year, I think that reconciliation is the most likely scenario, even though that is not our ideal. But regular order bills can serve as a template. You have all these regular order bills, they get a lot of support. All the bills that are in our, our primary asks, they get a lot of support, especially if they get Republican support. Those are gonna be more likely to have their pieces drawn from in order for that reconciliation bill. The reconciliation bill is gonna be huge. It's gonna be a this, a bit of that. Uh, you can choose your favorite analogy. You can choose splicing genes into a bacterium to manufacture life-saving uh, life-saving medicine, or if you're a bit Mary Shelley, like me, it could be you're taking uh, a leg here, uh, an arm there, uh, a couple of bolts from over there, and you're creating a Frankenstein's monster of a bill. Uh, but either way, these regular order bills are serving as a template, and Congress is going to take bits and pieces as they create this massive reconciliation bill. But bipartisan support for a standalone bill may enable moderate support for a reconciliation bill. Talking again about Manchin, talking again about cinema. I think they can vote for a Democrat-only reconciliation bill. I don't think Republicans can vote for a Democrat-only reconciliation bill. Uh, but I do think that Republicans can support a standalone carbon pricing bill, publicly support it, that is narrow and, and focused just on climate. And I think that their support for that standalone bill gives Manchin and Cinema the, the, the cover that they need to vote for a reconciliation bill that doesn't include a carbon price. That third bullet point, that's like the bank shot. It's not, it's not a swish with that basketball. You're using the backboard to make it in. Uh, but I, I think that if we get enough bipartisan support for a standalone bill from Republicans, I think that creates enough space for Manchin and Cinema, even if those Republicans who support that can't support the reconciliation bill that does include major components of those standalone bills. So and rem I want to remind you all of our, our bottom lines. Uh, what, whatever policy emergence emerges, the way the filter that we're going to look at that is, does this policy take a big chunk out of emissions in line with the science? And is the revenue used in such a way that the bottom two quintals are made whole? Those are the two bottom lines that we're going to use, the lines in the sand, to determine whether or not we recommend to you that we support this final product, whether it's a, whether it's a bacterium producing life-saving uh, medicines or whether it's a Frankenstein, I don't know, but we're gonna look at it through these two lenses. 
All right, so where we are now, uh, the Biden administration has uh, proposed a plan, uh, and this plan is important, uh, but what the Biden administration proposes, that's, that's actually not as important as Congress. Congress is, is the thing we need to fix. And I wanna point out that the media skews this. I know a lot of you are very concerned about Biden. You're very concerned about what Biden appointees may be saying or not saying about a carbon price. But remember, for people, for reporters, they have to tell a story. It has to be a compelling story. They have to tell it on tight deadlines. And it's just easier to understand what one man, President Biden, is or is not doing than what uh, 541 men and women are or are not doing. Congress is just messier. You can't understand, it's much easier to understand one person, one storyline, one history than 541 stories, histories, and how they intermix. And so media coverage is focused on the administration just because it's an easier story to tell. It doesn't mean that the Biden administration is more important than Congress for getting this stuff passed. And so I just wanna point out that there is a media bias because of the mechanics of being a reporter towards the president and towards cabinet officials, same thing. It's easier to focus in on Kerry, it's easier to focus in on Gina McCarthy than it is on the entire Republican caucus in the House and the Senate. Uh, and so our keys are going to remain the same as they were in March. We need to demonstrate that carbon pricing is popular. We're adding a new element pointing out uh, that it's popular among our peers, developed economies. We need to get tangible democratic support really focusing on getting those co-sponsors and getting those who are already co-sponsors to talk about their co-sponsorship and getting tangible Republican support. And yeah, we want them to be co-sponsoring bills. We've tried that. And so we're going to try this international lens uh, and asking them to focus on the border carbon adjustments in these bills and report back to us, tell us what they think in the context that we're laying out of being isolated and the consequences that has for where American money does or does not go and how business is able to compete. So that's, that's how we're gonna try and build Republican, tangible Republican support. Uh, so carbon pricing is popular again. So the US is one of the only two developed economies not to have a carbon price. This is the carbon pricing is popular document that we had uh, in March, we're updating it. Uh, I, uh, there, there's been some new updates. I mentioned the business updates. Let's talk about uh, tangible support. Uh, labor, the, the American Federation of Teachers has endorsed the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Uh, so this is, this is a, an important union. Uh, I believe uh, if, if John Clark is to believe, uh, be believed, and I think he is, I think he's trustworthy. Uh, the American Federation of Teachers is the third largest union in the country. And it is the largest single union within the AFL-CIO. And so their endorsement of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which you can find on the endorser database on energyinnovationact.org, is really cool. You also have something from the United Mine Workers, which is not an endorsement, which is not a statement of support. I'm going to read exactly what they said, because I think it's really important to get this right and to not oversell. What the United uh, Mine Workers said is they suggested a wires charge on retail electric power sales paid by utility customers, which would add about two tenths of one cent per kilowatt hour to the average electric bill. This would amount to less than $3 per month for the average residential rate payer. So they're, that, they're, they're thinking about effective, it's effectively a carbon price, but it is more narrow. Uh, and again, I don't want you to oversell this. If you bring up the United Mine Workers, please quote them. We'll make sure this document is available. We'll point out where it is. Uh, but nonetheless, if you have a member of Congress who, who is interested in what uh, mine workers are thinking, who's interested in what labor is thinking, I think this would be a good thing to bring up. Uh, and then I also mentioned the business support. Uh, that is also uh, really increasing in, in really, uh, really important ways. Even just this week, again, with Maersk calling for a $150 carbon price uh, on shipping fuel. Really, really impressive. Uh, for Democrats, uh, we want to share the important labor developments, those two I just talked about. Uh, in the House, again, we're building support for the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And in the Senate, 
Uh, I think that we, we want to build support for either the White House bill or the Durban bill, uh, but we also want to present this as a solution to many challenges at once. And I think that this is where you could consider, well, what if this is a pay for? Uh, get them to think we want, generally we want people thinking about this in new ways. We wanna, we wanna give the same basic message in, in new ways, uh, and we want them thinking about it in new ways. This is why we emphasize listening so much. If you really listen to what they're saying and you can turn that, that perspective uh, and get them to view the same thing from a different way, that can unlock a lot of potential. And so that's, that's what the pay for is really about. The pay for might be enough of a problem for them that they look at this through a new lens and then you end up with a co-sponsor on the White House bill, the Durban bill, uh, or, or they're talking to Republicans about this, uh, more action within Congress. Uh, now let's look at Republicans. Uh, we wanna share the EU's success in bringing China and Russia to the negotiating table. Again, this is something that they didn't believe was possible. Here we have the first opportunity to prove it and it's possible if you have a large economy that is putting a demanding accountability at their borders for emissions, uh, it prompts good behavior in the likes of China and Russia. I think we wanna emphasize the business support, the, the drumbeat of new announcements uh, from surprising places, again, getting them to look at this in a different way. And we want to try getting Republicans to engage with this policy idea through the lens of the border adjustment. The business piece, the Russia and China piece, that all feeds back into the border adjustment. And so let's, let's focus them on the world stage in a new way and see if we can get them to look at this same old issue from a different perspective and see if that unlocks some co-sponsorships, uh, some interesting questions and, and hearings, uh, some statements like the one we, uh, you've all seen from Romney uh, in, our, in our video before, uh, before a, a national call. Those, those really, really help with our, our mission. All right, so let's talk about uh, supporting asks. Uh, so the, the goals here, uh, number one, I wanna review uh, our success uh, and why CCL limits the number of supporting asks. I wanna understand uh, the, the best offices uh, for you to use a supporting ask in this June. So we'll go over the supporting ask and talk about this. Uh, really House Republicans are probably the best place to bring up supporting asks uh, and understand the strategy behind the supporting asks and how to use them to build relationships. We'll talk a little bit about that. So considerations. Uh, we do try and limit the number of supporting asks that we, we present. So right now there are five supporting asks. We had two in March, uh, now we have five. Why do we, I, I don't think, I'm not really comfortable going more than five. Why? Because part of CCL's power is our numbers. And so with five, you still get a good sense of our numbers. Uh, you have successes like the, the biggest number of co-sponsors that were added to the BEST Act, the Use It Act, and the Climate Ready Fisheries Act were in the months that CCL made our biggest push. And so you can see our impact on those three bills, former supporting asks, now the law of the land signed to law by President Trump uh, because we limit the number of supporting asks. You have so many supporting asks, too many supporting asks, you diffuse our numbers and we become less effective. Uh, so we do try and limit the number. Uh, all our supporting asks are bipartisan. That's, that's important. And all of our supporting asks are complementary to the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. That is that if that were to pass tomorrow, there would still be a reason to support these supporting asks. They would achieve something that the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act doesn't achieve or doesn't achieve quickly. Um, but I also wanna note that if you do use a different ask, you, you can. It is okay to use a, a, one of these non-official non uh, supporting ask. Just be clear that it's coming from your chapter and be clear that it's not one of the five official uh, CCL supporting asks. Um, but you, you can, with consultation with your chapter, choose your own supporting ask. And so uh, we again have the Growing Climate Solutions Act, uh, which was uh, reintroduced uh, in this Congress with a really incredible display of bipartisan support. 
uh, and it had, I think, 31 senators, almost equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans upon reintroduction. And Debbie Stabenow, Senator Debbie Stabenow, the lead Democrat in the House, when she was referring a reporter to organizations who support this, uh, she referred them to Ben and Jerry's and the Citizens Climate Lobby. And I take that as a sign that the work you did, because we were advocating for this before it was even introduced, the, sign, the work that we did was that important to the Senator in achieving that really impressive bipartisan display uh, in, in, a, in a time when bipartisanship is so infrequent. So I think, I think that this has a good chance of getting over the finish line. We are already an important part of the story of the Growing Climate Solutions Act, and I would really like to see it get over the finish line. This remains a, a good ask, especially if you're a member of Congress, is uh, a, uh, has a lot of ag in their district. Uh, so Growing Climate Solutions Act. The Reclaim Act, again, this is a, something that our, our coal country action team came up. They took me seriously when I said that uh, local chapters can come up with their own asks if they agree, and they, they used it without asking me. Uh, we do ask that you at least let Ben know uh, if, you're, if you're doing this, but it was effective in building support. They were able to get people to listen to them when they weren't listening before. It, it built the relationship. And that's another thing that these supporting assets are really trying to do is to build relationships. So Reclaim Act focused on coal country resilience still remains a good ask. Would also love to see that get over the finish line this Congress. To new ones for June, we have the Hope for Homes Act. Uh, and this is uh, focused on household energy efficiency. Uh, this, is, this is bipartisan, uh, but you'll notice in the document, it's uh, just by the skin of its teeth, is it bipartisan? Uh, it's got uh, Representative McKinley in the House. Uh, this is probably going to be a good bill for your progressive uh, members of Congress. Uh, you can, it would be great if you used it with Republicans and were able to get McKinley some company. I think that he would really appreciate that. Uh, but this is, uh, that's a new one. Uh, the uh, ESIC, the Energy Sector Innovation Credit Act. Uh, this is focused on providing investment and production tax credits for emerging clean energy technologies. Uh, this is going to be good for members of Ways and Means of, or, or Finance Committee, uh, for those who are generally interested in innovation uh, to drive the economy. So again, think Republicans. Uh, or renewable energy. A lot of Republicans fit into that category too. Um, but I will note that this is the only uh, supporting ask that hasn't been reintroduced yet. So there is a discussion draft in the Senate. Uh, Senators Whitehouse and Crapo are the, the leads on that. That's been out. Uh, Senator Crapo was talking about it in a recent hearing. Uh, and in the House, uh, it's, uh, you have a Democrat and Republican who introduced it uh, last Congress, and we refer to the 116th Congress version. We do expect this to come out in the near future, possibly before our lobby day. Uh, so we feel good about you making this ask. We don't think it will be a wasted ask. Uh, we just think that the members are, are still trying to push it out. And then you have the SCALE Act. Uh, this is uh, focused on developing carbon capture and sequestration infrastructure. Uh, and uh, Energy Sector Innovation Credit Act uh, uh, is what ESIC uh, stands for. And the SCALE Act focuses on building carbon capture and sequestration infrastructure and regional economic opportunities and jobs. Uh, this is uh, the Coons office and the Cassidy office uh, from, uh, from uh, Louisiana. Uh, I'm cognizant that for, again, House Republicans, carbon capture and sequestration is, is disproportionately popular with, with Republicans. Uh, and I know the Wild West uh, region in particular has a lot of interest in uh, carbon capture and sequestration. So this is an ask, uh, we, the Use It Act is passed. Uh, so for our volunteers who do have members who have those interests, uh, this is another way to continue that conversation in that vein. Uh, and I think that that brings us to uh, the, uh, just a wrap up here. Uh, on where where we can find things. And Brett, do you want to walk people through this? That all of these are now updated. They are in draft form until the final Senator Whitehouse bill is uploaded and we have the bill number. But if you go to CCL's resource page, which is available from the top drop down menu, if you just click on resources and training, there's a section there in the resources directory called lobbying Congress. And then from there, you can look for primary asks and supporting asks 
you can just search for those key terms in search and that will be the first hit as well. Uh, but all of the most key thing that comes up often with people's questions, all of those handouts Danny's mentioned, including the new developed economies one, as well as the carbon pricing is popular and the business statement, those will be updated by next week. And they're also all available on that primary asks because that one page is meant to be the directory of our leave behinds for June. So all of those are available on those two links that have been in the chat and I'll pass it to you back here, Danny. Yeah, and so I'll just say, please use these uh, to plan your meetings. A uh, reminder for the primary asks, those are drafts. Please don't send those until to your the offices you're gonna be meeting with until we finalize them next week. And the reason for that, again, is we, we want the title of the, of the White House bill uh, so that it, you're just gonna be more effective if we have that and don't wanna confuse things sending a draft that doesn't have that. Uh, and so I, I touched on this a little bit, but we, we trust our volunteers. That's, that's, our, that's what we do. Uh, we, uh, you're our most important resource. Uh, you don't have to live it yourselves to be supporting us. You can choose another bill uh, with consideration. Uh, with, you know, on board with the group, please do let Ben know if you decide to do that. And you can also consider softer supporting us like En-ROADS, uh, a specific briefing or uh, expressing support for carbon pricing elsewhere. All of those are, are viable. Uh, we just focus on specific bills, bipartisan, complementary for our official uh, supporting asks. He is just closed by saying, thank you all so very much for all of your efforts. I know this was an extended training tonight. And uh, again, we'll make sure that it's live by tomorrow afternoon on CCL YouTube. And we wanna just close tonight by thanking each of you for making the time and the investment and really studying up and feeling confident in your own lobby meetings. Also, thank you everybody for staying on for the extra long session. Really appreciate your dedication to, to the climate. All right, well, look at all this sea of friendly faces. I'm gonna unmute all lines. We are at time. I can't wait to hear everyone shout as loud as you can in your camera and we'll see you back here at the same time, same line next Thursday. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.